believe in this, we know very nothing about the history of the Vietnamese people. We should have been struck this week by the pretension of American diplomacy in vetoing the application of Vietnam for membership in the United Nations. Because we could easily have assumed, for example, that Mr. Stratton, when he accused the Vietnamese of not having yet achieved that level of civilization, enabling that country to sit with the other civilized nations of the world, really had drunk much too heavily from the well of hypocrisy. Uh, and that the government of the United States, which after all had left that country badly charred, had left its people half maimed, could give very few lessons in the arts of civilization to the Vietnamese, or, as a matter of fact, to those whom the American military was to call so elegantly the cooks. But we have history at our side. And with history at our side, we are in a much better position, after all, to begin to unravel those mysteries of American political rhetoric as it is established by the American ruling class and in which that rhetoric always is wrapped. For it is literally true that over the past 50 years, the main burden of Vietnamese history, after all, has been the monumental struggle of the Vietnamese popular classes to throw off the yoke of barbarism, which is precisely the gift of imperialism. Let's just cast our eye back on that decade of the 1930s for a minute. Because that decade tells us a tremendous amount, after all, not only about what imperialism is in all of its nakedness, but it tells us really a lot about what it takes in order for any people in any contemporary society who are colonized or exploited really to confront the ruling class, to confront the established order, to confront the power that oppresses them. And we have already noted that in the wake of that uprising of 1930 and 31, a popular uprising, if you please, which was the response of the peoples of Vietnam of the poor peasants and of the workers to the ravages of the Depression. In the wake of that uprising, the French colonial administration visited upon the nation of Vietnam a veritable reign of repression. We're talking, after all, about 10,000 or more or less Vietnamese who were killed in the pacification of 1931 and 32. We're talking about 50,000 Vietnamese, more or less militant, who were forced to go into deportation and exile. And we are talking, of course, about those 10,000 political prisoners who were sent off to rot in the jails of Vietnam. What we are saying is that in the first half of the decade of the 1930s, Vietnam became, for all intents and purposes, a police state, the French colonial administration imposing a police regime upon that people. So that at the center of that regime, and at the center of French colonial administration for a very long time, stood the Cité Générale, the Cité which was the political police the ubiquitous and all-seeing, all-knowing political police, which after all did smash the apparatus of various left-wing organizations over and again, which destroyed their cadre, which sent them into a very precarious clandestinity. A Sûreté Générale, which after all seemed to be the very best political police that any colonial administration had established every, anywhere. And if you want to know something about the level of sophistication, of surveillance, and of torture that those kinds of regimes in the Third World already had achieved in the 1930s, let me cite an observation that comes out of one of the monthly reports of the Sûreté Générale in which they sum up their actions. And so we read in the report of March of 1935, since 1908, we have operated successfully on the principle that the arrest of 10 militants of a nationalist party or group is quite sufficient to know about and break up the whole organization. Now just stretch your imagination a little bit and you'll know what happens to those 10 when they are picked up and why then they tell what the plans of the organization are and what its most inner secrets are. And yet there was frenzy and frustration on the part of this Sûreté. 
because the communists didn't act like other militants. That somehow you broke them up and they reappeared. Somehow you ripped out the roots and the roots came back. Somehow you smashed the apparatus and there was another apparatus. And the frenzy, I tell you, is terrific. That what the Sûreté Générale did in the 1930s was to expand its commissariats into those areas called critical red zones. What it did was to expand the number of spies that it had in its organization. And then it went international and consequently sent its political police to operate not only in Saigon and Hanoi, but also in Singapore, in Shanghai, uh, all the way over into Paris, anywhere where there were colonies of Vietnamese left-wingers. And they operated internationally in another way and noted in passing. And that is all of that collaboration with the political police of other colonies, whether they be British or French, operating, you see, on an early variant of that domino theory, uh, that somehow if one colony is to go communist, then the whole damn thing will fall to the left, and consequently uh, that it must be smashed. So that my very good friend Daniel Emery, who has written now the best book on the Vietnamese communists, a massive book which he calls Révolutionnaire Vietnamien et le pouvoir colonial, Revolutionaries in Vietnam and Colonial Power. And MLE can say that by the time you get to 1935, the history of the Vietnamese Communist Party is what he calls corps à corps avec la sûreté. Body to body with the sûreté, it was man to man against the police. And so it would be useful if we had the time really to discover what it is that makes an organization that plans a revolution, makes it stable, makes it durable, enables it to resist. It's an important question for us, of course, because as we examine we who belong in one manner or another to what is called derisively the American left. And when we examine, for example, why it is that we reap so little harvest out of the movement of the 1960s, then we come to two very important conclusions, do we not? That after all, the very test of any kind of a movement that seeks viable social change is continuity, is its capacity, after all, to exist in periods of defeat, to traverse periods of stasis, to stay. And secondly, after all, that the very key to that durability is that kind of a party which can build a structure and an infrastructure, no matter how it may offend our libertarian sensibilities, which is cut to the measure of the oppressive forces that it ultimately must confront. And that, after all, is critical in understanding something about the staying power of the Vietnamese Communist Party. But let me just use one example to show you what I mean. And I'm talking about the movement in the prisons. The movement in the prisons in the years of the greatest repression. Now, I don't have to read you descriptions of colonial or fascist prisons. It would do no good anyway. How in hell can we, who have not experienced it, know by words what it is to be in a fascist or a colonial prison, what the torture is, what the repression is, what the dehumanization is? Let it just be said that the French in Vietnam established an island prison called Pope or Pulo Condor. And Pulo Condor really was something quite special because what it did was to anticipate some of the refinements of the Nazi concentration camp. It was really one of the worst spots in the entire colonial world. But you see, you read those monthly reports of the Sûreté Générale, of the political police, which my friend Améry has published as appendices to his very big book, and you are struck by something incredible, that the Sûreté really 
underscores what in Marxist terms you can call the reproduction, the actual reproduction of the communist movement within the prisons. The enlarged reproduction so that it got bigger and stronger in the jails themselves. Listen to this report of March of 1933 of the Sûreté. Far from breaking these revolutionaries, incarceration seems to inflame their revolutionary spirit. They use their time to perfect their education, to politicize prisoners who aren't locked up for political reasons. They have an unbreakable will to agitate again as soon as they are released and the doors are open. And you see, in those reports, you get word at the beginning of 1932 that the police discovered in the central prison of Saigon what was called an association of prisoners organized by communist militants there with a central committee and giving courses uh, to prisoners who were less politicized than themselves. But the classic case, of course, is to come in, in, uh, in, uh, in the island prison prison itself in Pulau Condor because there in what was called Banya number no. two, prison number no. two, which was reserved for the hardcore militants of the communist movement, the communist party established its most important university in Vietnam. <laughs> because those who were in that prison were really alumni of two other very good schools, the Wen Ming School school in Canton, which was the party school established in that Chinese city, and of course the school of Eastern workers in Moscow, and what they did in Pulau Condor was to establish a newspaper. Now, they had no print, they had no books, it was a manuscript newspaper which they circulated in all the prison units of that island, a called Tian Yan, or forward, and of course it was an instruction in communism, an instruction in Marxism. Then they established courses, and consequently uh, they lectured and gave courses in history uh, and in uh, science, and especially in Marxism. Uh, but mainly, what they did was to organize those workers in that island prison into a movement of constant agitation. It was strikes against the uh, poison and abominable food. It was strikes against the slave labor, and finally it was just sheer mutiny against the prison regime. Uh, you see the point uh, that what is happening is that the movement is actually growing. Now, you know parenthetically that there is something about a prison movement which is really very explosive, uh, because there is no place where human beings can better discover uh, their exploitation than when they're incarcerated, and especially if there is instruction by by those who are really politicized. The trouble with those prison movements is that they very frequently are isolated and consequently succumb uh, to superior force. But in Vietnam it wasn't that way uh, because there was an infrastructure on the outside. Uh, there was uh, that great committee of amnesty uh, that was established by the French communists and that created a climate of opinion about how horrible the prisons were in Vietnam. And more than that, uh, there was constant interaction uh, with militants on the outside, who likewise militated in favor of these prisoners. But in the final analysis, these prisoners did it themselves. You see, when they heard uh, that the Popular Front had been elected in France, and that a left-wing government was there, and that they might be amnesty, they launched a general strike in the prisons. And it went, as it were, by signal, all the way from Saigon to Pulau Condor. And consequently, from May until the beginning of August, there was hell to pay in those jails, there was constant agitation, and we cannot not believe that that did not play its part in the 27th of August, 1936 amnesty, which passed through of the Parliament of the Popular Front. You see, that tells us something about the quality of that party, that it could go into those colonial jails and come out stronger. Well, the Popular Front of 1936, and that is a new plateau for the mass movement in Vietnam. 
And it is a movement, after all, which in 36 and 37 crest to a point that it had never reached, terribly important in understanding the link between that and the mass liberation struggle of the Viet Minh in 1944 and 45. And it is a measure of how mystifying establishment historians sometimes can be that you can read in those two fat volumes of Joseph Buttinger on 20th century Vietnam, a book called Vietnam, Dragon in Battle, why I don't know, uh, but in those two big fat volumes of Buttinger, you can read scarcely a single line about the movement of 36 and 7. Because if you read those lines, and if you told the story right, then how would it square with the premise of Buttinger, argued after all with a lot more emotion than data, that the Viet Minh, as a movement of liberation, was not a bona fide mass movement, but represented the seizure of power by a small and willful minority. It doesn't square with what happened to the communists in 1936 and 7. Now, I have told you that in the early years of the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, that party hewed to the line of pure class struggle, that it eschewed any kind of patriotic message, that it certainly avoided any kind of alliances with petty bourgeois or bourgeois nationalists, that what it did was to strike an alliance unusual in the whole 20th century history of social struggle with the small phalanx of Vietnamese Trotskyists, because the Trotskyists appreciated the intransigence of the party line at that particular time. But even though the communists and the Trotskyists were brave in trying to approach the workers and the poor peasants of Vietnam, they were operating in a framework of repression and their results were very derisive. But then you see the election of a left-wing government in Paris opened up new and brighter prospects. The Trotskyists uh, jumped upon it as meaning the opportunity really for the revolution in Vietnam, really for the armed insurrection, that the model of French workers by two million occupying the factories should inspire the Vietnamese to rise up in a mass and throw off the colonial yoke. And so we get in a Trotskyist track of the, 13, of the 13th of June of 1936 the following message. Comrades, workers in France by the billions have occupied the factories. Let's emulate them. Let's rise and revolt in the factories, on the plantations, in every province and village. Down with the imperialist government in Indochina, seize the property of the rich, long live the revolution in Indochina. The communists viewed it differently, and their view, in my judgment, was the sounder one. And their tactics at that time, the sounder. Just as the French communists really never knew what to do with their opportunity, the Vietnamese communists very decidedly knew what to do with theirs. Because their tactics now resemble what Mao and his comrades would call the mass line. By the mass line, we mean, of course, the process by which the very politically advanced leadership of a mass movement makes direct and immediate contact with those illiterate and often politically underdeveloped masses. The mass line means the process by which the advanced leadership accommodates itself to the aspirations, to the needs of those masses by discovering what they are in direct contact. It is that mass line, the process of immediacy, of specificity. It is the idea that the masses will become radicalized in struggle, and that that struggle will be over those issues, over those questions that they understand and that are most immediate to them. All of this was clarified brilliantly in a capital document, which is a letter that the Central Committee of the Vietnamese Communist Party sent out to its cadre in Nam Ki in September of 1936. And in that, the party says, in the immediate, there are two tasks. 
The first task is to mobilize the masses, and to do that by the struggle for immediate gains, and for immediate reforms, and to carry those masses step by step toward armed insurrection through the process of their struggle. But not to miss a single step, and not to go so fast that you try to make an armed insurrection before that mass has been properly mobilized, or before its consciousness has been deepened. The second task is the patriotic one. And here we rediscover what Ho Chi Minh had known quite well in the middle of the 1920s, that there is a great revolutionary potential in patriotism in a third world country. And so the party now said that it had to take the leadership in the struggle for national liberation that it had to demote the class struggle to the secondary plane in order to make alliances with any bourgeois or petty bourgeois force that was willing to struggle for national liberation. All of which is terribly important and significant in the history of Vietnamese communism. Because it means, of course, in the most ad hominem sense, a link once again with the Nguyen I Kok or Ho Chi Minh, who preached that same line uh, in his Revolutionary Youth League in the 1920s. In the second place, it means, after all, that there will be a kind of implantation of the Communist Party in the mass, that they will talk the language of people in all of its many different vocabularies. And in the third place, and what I think is critical, that what you have here creates the bridge between the 1930s and the Viet Minh, that Independence League of which Ho and his comrades would found in May of 1941. Did this mean that within the framework of the Popular Front, the Vietnamese Communist Party would wait for Paris to make certain reforms, or even to have independence on a placard. No, not a bit of it. And that is what is so fascinating, that even though there is a support of the Bloom government in Paris, there is a feeling that it is different from the colonial administration in Vietnam, and that what the masses have to do inside Vietnam is to mount a movement in order to force Paris to take steps, to take steps, and to clobber that colonial administration which is held bent on keeping all of the privileges of that regime in Vietnam. And how was the party to do this? Because the party is illegal, and it never is legalized by the French, and never legalized in the period of the Popular Front, and its existence is clandestine. Well, what it does, of course, is to build and to structure better its clandestine organization, but to articulate itself to meet the masses through a dazzling array of ad hoc organizations, women's unions, unions of peasants, youth leagues, sporting clubs, night courses, reading rooms, you name it, the Vietnamese communists tried to found them. And all of this meant that at the base the initiative came. It was from the base that the initiative came. Whatever the mass seemed to want or need, the communists tried to accommodate. And the congruity, or the convergence of all of those different initiatives, that was to remain for the clandestine structure. The party never disappeared. It is very much there. And it is to try to coordinate all of these initiatives into some overall strategy. And what is fascinating is that until the end of the fall of 1937, despite the differences in appreciation of what the situation of 36 meant, that the Vietnamese communists and the Trotskyists managed to continue to collaborate. Their collaboration really didn't break down until the fall of 1937, when each of them had built sufficiently a clandestine 
structure so that each didn't need the other just for sheer survival. And it was perfectly obvious why they stayed together. Because each group, for its own special interest, united on one goal. The goal was fantastic. The convocation of a Vietnamese assembly, of, an, of a Vietnamese convention, a kind of Estates General of 1789, a place where all of the Vietnamese people, through their representatives, could express their grievances, their veritable cahiers de doléances. And you see, there was method in this madness, because in order to prepare these lists of grievances, what the communists especially, and the Trotskyists likewise did, was to form comité d'action, committees of action, everywhere, in the villages, in the towns, in the cities, in one factory or another, on one plantation or another. Action committees in order to get the mass in that particular locale to articulate its grievances so that they could be brought up to this Indo-Chinese convention and then be laid upon the French as their demand. All of which begs one question. What about Paris? What about this popular front? And would that progressive government, with communist support, would it really hand forth immediately a series of fundamental reforms of the colonial regime? Would it permit the Vietnamese masses to become radicalized and to drive toward independence? Well, let's face it squarely that the issue of colonialism or the issue of imperialism is the litmus paper against which the ideology and the politics of any regime are tested. Those of you who have argued very genially with me before the elections about the fact that you thought that this present president-elect was the lesser of two evils. And I really had very little patience with it, though I showed more patience than I had. But it suffices to say that my real answer is that if the president-elect in office then immediately facilitates the immediate independence of Puerto Rico and then withdraws the military basis from around the world, then I would agree, but don't hold your breath. <laughs> and it suffices to say that as far as Vietnam is concerned, the uh, Popular Front government proved that it was nothing revolutionary at all. Now, in the Congress that the Socialist Party of Leo Blum held, just as the Popular Front government was being installed, there was this resolution passed that the Popular Front will open a new era for a working class France and for the peoples which she associates to her destiny. But that means, you see, that there is no independence, that the colonized people are to be associated to France, and that their betterment will come through noblesse oblige, through being handed reforms when the government in Paris chooses to, to be handed reforms, as it were, by their betters. You see what fascinated Bloor was the English model. He thought that the British were doing such a capital job of bringing civilization to their colonies. And consequently, he kept pointing to things like the Milner Inqui Inquiring Commission in Egypt or the Simon Commission in India. And he said that what France really needs is a good inquiring commission about Indochina. And consequently, in August of 1936, Bloom's government put forth a bill to establish such an inquiring commission. That bill was passed quickly in February of 1937. That commission gathered together for the first time in July of 1937. It never went to Vietnam. It read books in the Bibliothèque Nationale. <laughs> and consequently, by the time July of 1938 came, the Senate quite properly said it was doing nothing, cut off funds, and that was that. This is not to say that a socialist like Marcus Boutet 
who was the minister of colonies in Bloom's government, was not a man of good spirit. He would like to have reformed the regime in Vietnam. But you see, the commitment to anti-imperialism, and this is the point, was never strong enough so that the government in Paris, left-wing though it was, was willing to clean out the nests of colonialism in the empire, by which I mean to break up the apparatus, the administrative apparatus. You see, that is the very fulcrum, the very lever of colonial policy. What difference what a colonial minister says if it has to be put into effect by a governor general with his staff of permanent bureaucrats and who are sold completely on the colonial mission. And so it was that in Vietnam, for in Indochina, uh, that the French government did not clean out that nest, that they named as the governor general to Indochina a man named Joseph Blevier, and Blevier was himself an old colonial functionary who came out of the colonial service and was perfectly repressive about the role that France should play in Vietnam. And then you see when the mass movement really got going, those committees of action that really began to spread around the country, that became really a voice of the people, that gave the communists and the Trotskyists to a lesser degree a real stronghold in the mass, when all of that became so quickly, so powerfully apparent, Marius Boutet got frightened. And so he sent that cable of the 19th of September of 1936 already. He sent that cable to Brevier and he said, keep order that these committees of action, after all, will create insurrection, will create disorder. Well, you know, that was all the governor general <coughs> needed. Uh, by October of 1936, uh, there already were uh, certain leaders of communism and Trotskyism uh, back in prison. And yet, there is something about that popular front. And that is that it is liberal, and consequently it creates a cadre. Now listen, it's better to live under a liberal regime than a fascist one, because you can't function at all under a fascist one. And consequently, there were certain liberalizations by Paris, and that becomes the context for a mass movement. Because on the 27th of August of 1936, the law of amnesty is passed. And that means that not all of the political prisoners, but a certain large number of them will be released. Within a year, about 1,500 communists were released from those prisons and went back to their militant work, really shored up by their confrontations within the prisons. Uh, furthermore, the press regime was somewhat liberalized. So you see, within that context, it was impossible to hold the Vietnamese convention. The French wouldn't approve of that, wouldn't permit it. It was impossible to go much further with the committees of action. But from November of 1936 until the end of 1937, exploded what was unprecedented and unequal in any French colony, a wave of strikes that really echoed the strikes in France. For a colony, for a country in which the working class is small, we're talking in a 10-month period between October of 1936 until, uh, uh, until August of 37, we're talking about 400 strikes. We're talking about 60,000 wage earners involved. Now, if you use the figure of the government, that in 1931 there were 221,000 workers in Vietnam, that means one out of every four workers went on strike in that period. Or, if you use the more reasonable figure that the French, that the Vietnamese communists give, that there were nearly a million workers in Vietnam, 
That is, if you count all of those workers who were in the non-capitalist sector, in those tiny little atelier or workshops <coughs> of textile or brick making or sugar refining, then you have one out of 18 workers on strike, which for an under-industrialized country is a tremendous amount in a very short period of time. But more than that, those strikes are so important in the formation of a mass movement. They are important in the first place because they really do create a new radical consciousness. They create a sense of class. Because you see, workers in Vietnam had been benighted and passive and calm, and they had submitted to recruitment. But in these strikes, they won a good deal of the time. We have results for 222 strikes. 181 received satisfaction. And so that is muscular. That is positive. That gives a sense of strength. Secondly, note that there is contact between those worker strikers and the villages, that there's no such kubil, no such rupture between worker and peasant as there is in Western society, that many of these strikes took place in the non-capitalist sector, in those tiny little shops in small towns, close to villages, where the workers were in constant return and comings and goings to the villages, and consequently inspired agricultural workers to go on strike also. But most important, the implantation of Vietnamese communism. It came through that strike period. The only national revolutionary party, the only party that could mobilize the mass in all three sections of the country, the only party that had roots in the village and the city, in small industry and big, the only party that could also speak for the liberation of the country as well as its social liberation. It is the making of Vietnamese communism, and it pays off in that struggle of the early 1940s against the Japanese. <coughs> Noted in passing, the Vietnamese communists have their drawbacks, but they have learned magnificently not only to walk tightropes, but to do whole ballets on them. <laughs> and consequently, long before the war really drew down a curtain between the Vietnamese communists and Moscow, they were interpreting the Popular Front in their way, and not Moscow's way, and certainly not the French Communist Party's way. For them, the resistance to fascism was anti-imperialism. For them, the Popular Front was not an alliance at the top, but an expansion of the base. Do we need a document to show us the difference between these Vietnamese communists and their French comrades? Listen to this resolution of the Central Committee of the 13th of March of 1937. The Bloom government is only a capitalist government with a progressive view. We support it insofar as it can mobilize, as it can generate reforms and contain fascism. But in no way have we forgotten that our primary duty is to catalyze the masses into defending their immediate interests and into getting their revolutionary education. In no way does our support of the Paris government relieve us of our daily obligation to criticize its capitulations to colonialism or to struggle against the barbarous policy of the reactionary bureaucracy in the colonial administration. And so it said it squarely. It would go just so far. It could certainly not condone that kind of a government that let imperialism run rapid in Indochina. And you see, 
It is on the basis of that legacy. A legacy, after all, of mass action and support. It is on the basis of its role as the heart and soul of revolutionary patriotism uh, that the Vietnamese Communist Party was to mobilize again the masses against both Japanese and French imperialism. Japan, interested in Indochina. Interested in Indochina largely because she was mainly interested in China. And consequently, the attack upon China under, got underway in force in 1937. By October of 1938, Japan had occupied the city of Canton in the south of China, which meant that Vietnam was of two very great interests to Japan. First of all, that the only point of entry for military supply to the Kuomintang armies that were fighting against the Japanese in the southwest of China came through the Vietnamese South China frontier, or precisely through the Tongking Yunnan Railroad. And consequently, the Japanese wanted that frontier closed. But secondly, in order to take off that monumental task of conquering China, they wanted the resources of Vietnam. Uh, they wanted the food supply, and they wanted the rubber, the coal, the minerals. Now, quite obviously, the Japanese could have overrun Indochina had they chosen to, and the French colonial administration couldn't have stopped them. But they wanted no resistance and they wanted production to go on unhampered. And consequently, it was much more convenient, if possible, to satellize the French colonial regime in Indochina. In other words, to make a deal in which nominally that regime would remain sovereign, but the Japanese would get what they wanted. All of which became monumentally easy once France fell and the Vichy regime came into power because Vichy immediately replaced the governor general at that time, who was called General Hatsou, and who was something of a free French Gaullist, and replaced him with an admiral, Admiral Jean de Caux, and Admiral de Caux, a complete reactionary, struck the deal for Vichy with the Japanese. Because on the 22nd of September of 1940, Admiral de Caux struck the arrangement with General Nishihara, the Japanese general, and they made an agreement whereby the Japanese would send some 35,000 troops into Indochina, and secondly, would be able to utilize any military installation necessary in order, as the Deku uh, 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 Nishihara agreement went, in order to resolve the China incident. Uh, for the Kalong, for the French Kalong, to have the Japanese there was no greater problem than for Vichy to have the Nazis up in the north. Because it's a fascist gang. And they are really fascist types, those Kalong. Now, they're not as obvious as the ones in Algeria. Because in Algeria, the gang is much bigger. And it doesn't have the social base, really, in Vietnam. But they can live very comfortably as long as they can keep their property and keep their profits. And so the Japanese presence economically greatly, greatly clobbered the Vietnamese masses, but didn't really touch the rich Cologne by a series of economic agreements in the spring and summer of 1941. What Japan demanded was that all of the exportable commodities in rice, in rubber, in coal, in minerals, go to Japan. Well, after all, that didn't change the basic export strategy of Vietnam. All it did was to change the direction of it. Now the Cologne had to sell everything to the Japanese. But what that meant, you see, for the Vietnamese masses was hell on wheels because the Japanese took so much, demanded so much, that by 1943, there were terribly severe shortages. The Vietnamese peasant and worker going around in rags because there were no new clothes, the cloth having been taken. Worse than that, 
that the food supply went terribly short, grotesquely short, after the bad harvests of 44 and 45, so that if you can stuff it into your imaginings, in the winter of 1944 and 5, in one of the worst natural holocausts of the century, the Vietnamese, especially of Tonkin in the north, lost by starvation between a million and a half and two million. Now, the Japanese played a bit of a double game, because even though they were satisfied with the collusion of their code, even though they were satisfied with the collusion of a regime that was repressive not against them, but against the Vietnamese masses, that really made the Sûreté into an everyday affair, even though they were satisfied still, they might one day want to take it all. And so the Japanese began fishing in troubled waters, and they began setting up conversions of right-wing nationalists, those who belonged to the right wing of the Constitutionalist Party, those who were Mandarins, saying the Japanese will oust the French rule, you will have your own regime which will be our puppet. And the Kuomintang in China, Chiang Kai-shek, Jimo himself, is likewise fishing in troubled waters. Because he is thinking that if China wins, and certainly with American support, it will probably win and probably drive back the Japanese. And if so, China will be a great power, and why shouldn't it satellize Vietnam? And so from those refugees of the, of the old Nationalist Party, the old Vietnamese Nationalist Party, the VNQDD, he began to set up Chiang Kai-shek, certain kinds of puppet committees, nationalists, who would go back and be the cat's paw of the Chinese nationalists. In that context, Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese communists operated swiftly and efficiently. Now, where is Ho? We leave in 1931. At the time of the repression, he is in Hong Kong. And the French administration wants him extradited so they can put him in jail. The British don't extradite him. They put him in their own jail, saying he is dangerous and consequently is there for two years. Between 1934 and 38, he is up in Moscow. Then in the summer of 38, he goes to Yan'an to the Chinese Communist base, and there has confabulation with the Chinese Communists. And then at the beginning of 1940, we find him in the south of China, on the Vietnamese frontier and border, where in the course of 1940, he makes contact with other members of the communist apparatus who have been driven out by the repressive regime of Deco. And it is this group that contains his greatest comrades. It is Phan Van Dong, who becomes, of course, the Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of North Vietnam. And it is, of course, Vo Nguyen Goyen Zha, the great Zha, who is the architect, after all, of Vietnamese guerrilla warfare and the great victor of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Both of them long-time communists, Zha, who had given up a marvelously comfortable life, as he once said, as a history teacher, uh, to become this kind of revolutionary. And we should all have it so good. And consequently, it suffices to say that within that context, Ho decided that the moment had come, the time was ripe for a liberation movement. That the French were weakened, Possibly, he thought, the Kuomintang might supply arms because they would be able to send a force against the Japanese. That didn't work out. But nonetheless, in May of 1941, after considerable confabulation, discussion, organization, Ho Chi Minh and his comrades crossed the frontier from South China into the northernmost, very, very mountainous, very barren part of Vietnam, came back to his country for the first time in 30 years. There, found a very secluded spot, 
that was cut off from the rest of Vietnam by a mountain, which Ho Chi Minh called Karl Marx Mountain. And behind the mountain, there was a grotto, which he called Lenin Grotto. <laughs> and there in Lenin Grotto, behind Karl Marx Mountain, the Vietnamese communists met between the 10th and the 19th of May of 1941 and decided to found and launch the Viet Minh, the Independence League of Vietnam, to gather together all and any who are willing to struggle for national liberation, regardless of sex, regardless of religion, regardless of previous politics, as long as the goal was liberation. In the program of the Viet Minh, there were reforms, political and economic, but they were not reforms that went so far that they would frighten off the petty bourgeoisie. Because about land, the reform of the Vietnam and the Viet Minh went no further than to say that the land of the traitors will be expropriated and divided among the landless peasants, which meant those who collaborated with the Japanese, those who collaborated with the French, that certainly uh, did not interfere uh, with the private holdings of small uh, petty bourgeois farmers in Vietnam. And it took two years between 41 and the end of 43, before Jean, who was put in charge of the guerrilla warfare, had laid an infrastructure. It was done very carefully and very slowly. It was done first by political groups, political groups that should go around in those northern villages and begin indoctrinating, that there was to be no armed conflict, certainly no effort at an insurrection, and Ho was constantly muting those calls for insurrection on the part of very much more uh, inflammatory communists, muting them until such time as there was readiness. Finally, it is not until December of 1944 that Jacques organizes what is called the Armed Liberation Brigade. And that is the guerrilla army. And that is the army that will go province to province and begin that task of liberating the country which already has been seeded for over two years with political work and with political propaganda. And so it is that in that winter of 1944 and 5, the Japanese had a dilemma. Because they saw this guerrilla movement beginning to move, and they got frightened that that country might be liberated by a revolution before they <coughs> occupied it. And so the Japanese decided on a bold move. The 9th of March of 1945, the Japanese disarmed all French troops in Indochina, and themselves occupied the country and established a puppet government. The puppet government under the Emperor Bao Dai, who proclaimed the independence of Vietnam, but it really was a Japanese satrapy. And the very next day, the 10th of March, after that bogus independence, Jop began an offensive which did not stop until in June, the armies of liberation were 40 miles from, uh, from Hanoi and until the beginning of July when all of the major cities except Saigon had fallen to the liberation forces. All was ready for the liberation movement of August of 1945. All was ready except Washington. Because in the United States there was interest. Oh, there wasn't very much interest in Vietnam, historically. But then you see, in the late 30s, between 35 and 39, the United States began buying quite a bit of rubber from Vietnam. 92,000 tons in those years, which constituted about 38% of the exports of rubber of Vietnam. And all during the early stages of the war, Roosevelt and the State Department were puzzling what would happen if the French were permanently driven out of Indochina. It's a vacuum 
and wash me till you pour it back in. And consequently, the idea occurred that somehow it should not be given back to the French. If they lost it and were driven out, that was that. And so all through 43, Roosevelt was toying around with the idea of a four-party trusteeship in Indochina. That Indochina should come under the four-party control of France, Great Britain, Kuomintang uh, China, and the United States. And since Kuomintang China was a cat's paw of America, it meant 50% of the influence there. He got to Tehran. Roosevelt did in December of 43, and he mentioned the plan uh, to Stalin and said, what do you think about that? And Stalin said, well, seems all right because Vietnamese independence, after all, won't really come for another half a century anyway. And consequently, there was no problem with the Russians. The British raised the problem because they were concerned about restoration of their empire and they didn't want to finagle around with French rights and really wanted the French restore. And consequently, by the time you come to 45, to the very eve of the liberation in August of 45 by the Viet Minh armies, by these guerrilla armies, the United States has suddenly intervened with two very spectacular moves. One is, after all, the agreement of Potsdam in July of 1945. Because by that agreement, the uh, occupation, Indochina, was to be divided into two zones of occupation. A northern zone, north of the 16th parallel, which was to be occupied by Kuomintang China. And as a matter of fact, by the end of August, the Kuomintang, which was supposed simply to go in and disarm the Japanese, sent an army of 200,000 under General Lu Han because it was concerned to make a satrapy out of the north. The south to be occupied by the British, who would then, of course, uh, turn it over to the French. But more than that, came on the 14th of, of August of 45, famous General Order Number 1. General Order Number 1, which came out under this, over the signature of Truman and the War Department, which was that general policy statement about what would happen with the defeat of Japan. This is four days after the surrender of Japan. The United States is worried about the fact that the defeat of the Japanese armies in Korea, in the Dutch East Indies, in Indochina, in the Philippines, that in all of those countries, the defeat of those Japanese armies may give way to revolution and insurrection. No, that cannot be. Order number one said that General Douglas MacArthur is the commander of everything in the Far East, and that consequently all surrender of the Japanese goes through his hands, and he is deciding who then shall take that surrender and occupy the country. As the Vietnamese liberated their country, as we go back in that history, all of those decades and centuries to that point of liberation comes out of this bolt, order number one, to say that in Vietnamese history, it is not Confucianism, it is not Marxism, it is certainly not any kind of, of premise of struggle that really is the determinant, but the presence of Douglas MacArthur. <laughs> Strange irony about which there would be a quarrel. <laughs>